death in 2019, but pretty much if you visited today, it would look the same. More than likely, if you visited 100 years ago, it would look the same. So there's a hidden treasure under this blur of green. So let me describe what you're seeing under the haze. So when you walk into the sala, you look up two stories, and you see a 2,500 square foot dome that Leonardo da Vinci painted. You're surrounded by 16 trees and hundreds of interlocking branches with 37 uh, knots gold, in gold leaf meandering through the foliage of mulberry leaves. And it all converges right to the top of the dome, this family crest that merges two families, the D'Este family and the Forza family. So Leonardo da Vinci was uh, commissioned by the uh, Duke of Milan to do this um, fresco painting on the dome. Um, what had happened was that it was to commemorate um, Duke uh, Ludovico Sforza's wife who had an untimely death. And to commemorate it, um, he did this ceiling. So what had happened was his wife, Beatrice de Este, was, uh, died previously dancing pregnant with her second son, she was only 23 years old. Now unfortunately, no matter how many millions of euros the city of Milan pays for this restoration, the public is never gonna see what I can show you in an iPhone with my digital restoration. Well, in um, early 1900s, this man, Luca Beltrami, uh, he's a historian and an architect. He gets permission to restore Leonardo's Sala delle Asse, the Room of Knots. Unfortunately, though, he does not follow Leonardo's original design and takes a little creative license. Well, to say that, and he does it in the contemporary fashion of the Art Nouveau period. Well, to say that uh, he ruined Leonardo's masterpiece is a uh, understatement. I mean, he should have been horsewhipped for what he did. Okay, so with uh, Beltrami's debacle, no books written on the Room of Knots, and pre-Beltrami images scarce, it has taken me many, many, many years to recreate the Room of Knots. And now I could show you, and really thank you for this opportunity. This is the, my first group where I'm sharing this uh, research that I've done, and hopefully the world Leonardo's masterpiece. So it's laid out flat, but on the perimeter, what we have here is we have uh, 16 arched walls and 16 vaulted ceilings. So to give you a little bit of perspective, uh, each uh, wall is five feet in width. Now this is a very, very rare image. So now we are right under one of the vaults. And you could just see, I mean, just look at the expertise of all the crisscrossing. Absolutely perfect, perfect symmetry. <coughs> His workmanship is impeccable. Now this is Beltrami. Now look what he does with the golden rope. In a brush, he has erased all the knot crossings. I mean, this was a lifetime of study and what a tragedy. So with my collaboration with uh, Knot Mathematician Rob Shrine, we've taken um, this wall, which is number 16, and we've digitally restored the cord. I'm hoping that my video works. Come on, honey. Hmm. I, I guess not. Let me go back. Oh, what a shame. Oh, I'm so sad. Anyway, luckily I put this slide in, so I have it, you know, completely going through. But this, this is the cord on that one wall, and you can just see the perfect in symmetry. I mean. Here it goes over, there it goes under. I mean, he just doesn't miss a beat. I'm sad that I, the video doesn't work, but anyway. So uh, I knew that Leonardo would uh, have intent for you to see it in a dome. So I had an opportunity to um, do a demonstration at the Dinanza Planetarium. So this is what you would see when Leonardo finished it in 1498. He was 50 years old. 
Now, did he do that all himself, or did he have? Uh, well, video? we don't have any documentation. No, 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 no. I'm going to tell you the two documentations we no, do no, have. No. So this is what it looks like, laid out flat, digitally restored. All the the uh, gold ropes, the foliage, the whole thing. But for a moment, let me have a chance just to blow the leaves off and untangle all 37 gold ropes and just expose the trees and the branches. Well, uh, what I'm expecting is a pergola. You know, a pergola is defined as an archway in a garden consisting of a framework covered in a train climbing plants. So this is on display at the Forza Castle, and this is what they're representing that should be underneath the foliage, but my digital restoration, something very unexpected showed up. Okay, so uh, the, the uh, trees and the branches is made up of four patterns. So this particular pattern is right at the top of the dome. And as you can tell, he uses this cruciform in the center. Like, so we're going north, south, east, and west. And see this cruciform that it forms? Uh, this is um, one of uh, Leonardo's reoccurring theme. We find this in a lot of his not, not artwork, the, uh, the cruciform. This, um, this uh, set of uh, four branches, so it, this would be 2 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 7 o'clock, 11 o'clock. And this is where you find, unlike the symmetry, perfect symmetry of all the branches over, under, over, here every 37 knot is original. They're not two alike. So this is on the seventh, seventh position. So when we find this one, this is, a, this is the only cruciform he does in the whole room of knots. And see the patterning over from right to left, this cord goes over on this cruciform. And this is the same pattern that we find on the Mona Lisa, on the Mona Lisa knot. So this was his logo, his trademark, his, his thumbprint. And then this is the third pattern of branches and uh, trees. And this is the fourth. And then all merged together, this is what we see. Wow. Drugs involved or anything? <laughs> I mean, doesn't it remind you, did any of you guys play this as kids with the full thing? <laughs> yep. The in and out, doesn't it look so much like that? Yeah. Well, but it wasn't until I domed the ceiling that I saw something very, very unexpected. Not a pergola at all. Well, you're in Leonardo da Vinci's cathedral, his sacred space. Mm -hmm. um, he, he always wanted to do a cathedral. We have in his notebooks, like he drew some 30 architectural drawings of cathedrals. And then uh, the famous architect at the time was Bermonte. He was the court. Um, architect and he and Leonardo both uh, had turned in a design to do the cupola at the famous Duomo uh, Cathedral in um, Milan and he he withdrew his uh, submission but just for a mo and we um, just for a moment just imagine yourself in the very center of this cupola and you're looking up at the ninth circle into the heavens Mm. And all, all the uh, golden cords. Um, I'm, do, I'm very dubious that the current restoration <coughs> is going to um, be restoring all the knot crossings on the 37 um, ropes. And I don't know if they are going to also do it as they, he originally did them in gold leaf. Carolyn, mm. if they're restoring, does that mean that they would also enhance any of the colors? Or? Well, they're supposed to, they're very, you know, they, they don't uh, announce to you exactly what they're going to do. So when I called the director, you know, I asked them, do you have evidence of gold leaf? And they say yes. And then I said, are you going to restore it in gold leaf? And then, you know, it gets a little foggy, <laughs> the, the answer. Okay. They said, do you, do you want to make a donation? Yeah. yeah. That's right. yeah. Are you funded? Yeah. 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 Right. So uh, somebody had asked me, these are the only two documents that we have at the time that Leonardo's working on it. Uh, this one here is from the treasurer to the Duke, and it reads, the 21st of April, 1498. Maestro Leonardo promises to have everything finished 
by the end of September. And then on the 2nd of October, 1498, the Duke has gifted a vineyard to Maestro Leonardo, the painter. I mean, it's, it's hard for me to imagine that he finished that in seven. I mean, it is such a complex design. Um, all's like, you know, and he has a bad reputation of never finishing anything, but he must have been absolutely had a passion <coughs> to get this done. Well, I know I've shown you a lot of eye candy, but I just can't let you go without telling you about the Accademia Vinciana, not series one through six. So Leonardo does these six mandalas of interlocking extravaganza. Again, um, art historians are trying to figure out what was the purpose of this Accademia. We don't know. All that are, we're left is uh, the beauty of the artwork. I mean, we don't even know why he stamps his name at the center of all of them. Um, now I'm wondering if these, he does th this series three years be before he does the Room of Knots, and now I'm thinking that maybe these were the preliminary drawings. But uh, what I'm showing you here are facsimiles. Um, it, these were done by the uh, German printmaker Albert Durer. Durer and Leonardo had met in Venice in 1506, and luckily Durer copied them or we wouldn't have them at all. <coughs> Well, this is um, one of them. It's called Knot Five. Wow. This is it completed. But miraculously, these every one of them is different. We know exactly how many knot crossings are in it, how many strands, how many components it's made of. <laughs> knot Five is made up of these components. Miraculously, there's an octagon embedded in there, a lovely snowflake, nugatory chains with a half a twist come undone. And now I don't think my video is going to work, but this is what it looks like all unraveling. Oh, what a, what a sadness. You're going to have to have me back. That's all I can <laughs> say. Oh, my God. You could email me. <laughs> and you're like, so anyway, what's my, my goal is to restore the uh, Sala, the Room of Knots, and digitally restore it exactly the way Leonardo did it, every over and under. So all the proceeds from my book, Leonardo's Knots, um, I'm working on producing a, a video. Mm -hmm. And so, um, any questions? Thank you for having me. This is really, really yeah. great. <laughs> yeah. Um, Richard, in the early part of the presentation, I was talking about um, the joining of the two families. Yes. I mean, where, where is that on the dome? Um, it's at the very center of the dome. It's the, the crest. I, I don't think you could see it. I, I didn't put it in my reg oh, okay. restoration. So I didn't miss it. You no, it. I okay. just didn't put it in. So how, how big is that? Is physically the dome? Well, um, you know, that, that's a good question. It's got to be five to seven feet. Okay. I mean, it's got to be pretty large. It's 2,500 square feet, yeah. the, the dome itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, it's it's so sad. We have no documentation on, you know, who else was working on it. But he must have had this really well developed in his mind, and it could have been those preliminary mandalas that you know he had been working on <coughs> that clearly, uh, because I haven't found any preliminary drawings. But is there evidence on how he did that? I mean, I can't even imagine doing that without computers. Well, he used the spiral graph, right? We don't know. We have no information. Oh, the thing? Yeah. No, like the kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know, um, he did, we, I did all those designs. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. You know, you have the eight the smaller circles and then the nine. So it really follows that kind of Gothic cathedral interior space. So, what's the fear? This gets redone uh, in an inexpensive, flashy way to attract tourists and then not the original? Is that you, what I mean? Well, who knows? I mean, and for you to really get get in there, you can't because you've got to look two stories up before you even, you know, can see the dome. So I, you can never get inside it. Like I can bring you right in there. I can, you know, like with all this immersion stuff. So this is 2,500 square feet, but it's only 16 feet tall. Oh no! It, uh, well, the dome, the top, uh, you know, but it you doesn't. Said two, you said two stories. So I'm, I'm no, it doesn't like start. It doesn't start feet. till two stories up. Oh, okay, so it starts at twenty. Uh, it, starts it starts at twenty. At 20 feet and goes up. How yes. Further from there. Uh, I would say I'm not really sure. I, you know, I don't know. I know it's twenty-five hundred square feet, 
this way. I don't know how high the dome is. Okay. Did Zinich do anything in CC? Do you know? No, he didn't. Okay. So, how are people going to get drawn to this? If you're coming into the line, how, where would I, what would I find out that I know I would want to go to that? Uh, you know, I took my friend on when I went there, and it's it's just a blur. It's a blur. You have no concept of what's this hidden treasure that's underneath, and just the mathematical knowledge he had to have to put this together. It's just it's over the top. I mean, to me, I think it should be like the Sistine Chapel. I think everybody should know about it. That's my job. How many visitors a year do these people think that they have? Now. Oh no, it's nothing like the the Last Supper. You know that is, mm -hmm. you know that's bringing in every fifteen minutes. You know, uh, thirty to fifty people. So you know, they, uh, that's getting uh, millions of euros for them. This I don't know if it's going to have a chance. Um, a little side note: I know that the Rotary in Milan is a sponsor for the restoration. So if any of you know any mm -hmm. that want to sponsor me. I'm available <laughs> for making a presentation. Yes. Help me with our history. <clears throat> when were the uh, when did uh, the really complex and mathematically driven uh, or, or uh, oriented <clears throat> part of the uh, Muslim world come into Europe? For example, the Alhambra. You know, the very complex. Uh, Let's see the Al <coughs> the Alhambra. When did the, I think that was a lot earlier. That, in a lot of like 1400s, yeah, you know, influence. He, he was tough, yes, he has a lot of, uh, all that geometrical uh, is mm -hmm. all an influence for him. Mm -hmm. And then of course, you know, he was born out of wedlock, some say his mother was from in the eastern, uh, you know, so there, <laughs> we wonder, we don't know for sure who his mom was. Oh, really? Yeah. Normally, you don't know who the father is. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it, it's very unusual because actually um, he lived with his dad and his grandfather, and which in any era in life, normally you're going to live with your mom. Yeah. But that was not the case. She may have died. No, no, she was alive. No, she, she was alive, yeah. <clears throat> But, um, do you believe there's a Mona Lisa a self portrait, do you think? No, it's not a self portrait. Okay. And um, so that's how I kind of got into this. Once I made the discovery that it was um, not a, a decorative loopy, but mathematical, then I started following the knots. And knots back then are like today are logos. So when, but individuals would have logos that were, you know, a private mm -hmm. thing. And so in following the knots, it led me to the room of knots. <coughs> so. Oh, that's really interesting. Did you find knots in many other things, many other uh, drawings? And oh, he things? leaves a knot on every one of his drawings. Like I'm sure you've seen uh, the Last Supper, right? Yep. Okay, but did you notice the knot in the lower? <coughs> so right here, see that knot right there? It's oh, pretty deliberate. I, no, I did not. How come your Last Supper has open? Yeah. So he always leaves the knot on every one of his paintings. And then once he starts doing the Mona Lisa, then those knots become Leonardo's knots. They're his own creation. But up until then, like the one even on the Last Supper, these are knots of antiquity. So this one would have been known as the knot of Isis. We find it in hieroglyphics. It's always uh, associated with a female goddess, and it means the tying and uh, releasing. They all have symbolic meanings, none that which have wavered. So he, had, he wasn't married, right? He wasn't married. No he, children? He had no children. So are these dukes and whatnot giving him stuff, knowing that it'll just go back to the crown when he dies? Um, or how did that well, work, you know? He, you mean what was his will and testament? Is that yeah, what I mean, if I'm going to give Chris a vineyard, I'm going to give Chris a vineyard. Yeah. I know he doesn't have a wine to get it back. So he had, he had um, two assistants. He had two assistants. Okay. Uh, one was a guy by the name of Meltzi. And after uh, and he inherits all of his notebooks. And he gets the vineyard. Okay. Yeah. Was he a guy also you know thought that he was going to get his money? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Get it back. Yeah. 
<laughs> and then um, his other uh, assistant, you know, for instance, before he died, got the Mona Lisa. It goes back to Italy. It, it, you know, he sells it. He doesn't live very long after, um, you know, Da Vinci died. <coughs> How old would you need that? 67. That's not bad in those days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, So is there a documentation on his, uh, the crew that he had for the Sistine Chapel or anything? Well, that was Michelangelo. Oh, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he okay, spent so 25 years. I think there's more. And they're, they're 25 yeah, years yeah. apart in so age. So what other, I mean, like other projects. I mean, was he known to have a crew kind of thing? Um, you know, he, uh, yeah. no. He, we know he has two assistants, okay. and that's it. Wow, that's incredible. So uh, who knows who did 2,500 square feet in yeah. seven months. Yeah, that's crazy. So, anyway, thank you guys for right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you for your support of Leonardo. No trucks. No trucks. No drugs. No drugs.